Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Okay, well, welcome back. It's our tradition to go around the room in, our, in person and say our names. And um, we also have many folks online we can wave to. So uh, my name's Grisha. My name is Todd. Ben. <clears throat> my name is Henry. My name is Lee. I'm Mark. My name is Jeff. Matthew. Tim. Richard. Jack. Trevor. My name is Cass. Jay. All right, so our teacher today is John Martin. Um, John teaches Vipassana, Metta, and LGBTQIA meditation retreats. He leads an ongoing weekly Monday evening meditation group in San Francisco. He serves as co-chair for the Guiding Teachers Council for Spirit Rock. John is also currently serving as the interim executive director for Spirit Rock. His practice has been supported by 12 years as a hospice volunteer, including five years at Shanti Project during the AIDS crisis and seven years with the Zen Hospice Projects. Um, so welcome, John. So uh, just to say, I'm no longer interim executive director. Hooray. No longer interim, interim director of Spirit Rock. Return to just being a teacher. And uh, happy to be here in the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. So many old friends and uh, Friends I want to reach out to on camera who I haven't seen in years and give a big hug to, and friends here in person who I again can connect with and give a hug. And many folks I, I recognize from over the years. It uh, sometimes feels like we really live in a small town uh, being gay in San Francisco. And so great to be together in community in the Sangha. I just was reflecting this morning, yesterday, on that, the value and importance of the Sangha and uh, the Buddha said there's such an importance in our practice of being connected in Sangha and supporting one another. And, uh, I feel that. I feel that when I'm here, every time I'm here in the group. I always look forward to, to being here with the group. So today I want to speak about happiness. Uh, I think I spoke about happiness three or four years ago here as well. And my own understanding of happiness continues to develop with my with my practice. I'm both a teacher and, but more importantly, a practitioner. So um, insights, understandings continue to arise with the practice. And in fact, I'm doing a month-long retreat at uh, Forest Refuge in March. So, nice to have the time for that. So there's two kinds of happiness I'll speak to today. There's a, basically the happiness of the world, kind of a worldly happiness, the happiness we experience when Things are going our way. And when we're healthy, we have a good meal, time with friends, kind of worldly happiness. And then there's a deeper kind of happiness that we begin to open to with our practice of mindfulness, of being present, aware, cultivating what is wise and skillful. And this deeper kind of happiness is um, the word the Buddha used was sukha. It's more like a calm, contented, peaceful kind of happiness. It's ultimately independent of any condition of the world. It's a great kind of happiness that the idea that we can be happy even when we're sick, maybe even when we move to the end of our lives, when things don't go our way, maybe our finances aren't good or we have a difficulty at work. With our practice, we can find a peace and contentment that carries us, carries through both in times when we're experiencing joy and good fortune and carries through when we're experiencing difficulties and challenges in our lives as well. I want to talk especially about that second kind of happiness and how we can cultivate that happiness, develop it in our lives. And it's really a choice point we can make and cultivating what is wise and skillful, and bringing more happiness, more sukha into our lives. 
So the Buddha, the Buddha was known as the happy one in his time. He lived 2,600 years ago. The Buddha, human being, and he fully realized the truth of the way things are. And it was said the Buddha could see into the entire depth of suffering, could see the suffering of the entire world, present, past, and future. That's a lot of suffering to see. And he could see that all, hold it with compassion, and yet he was known as a happy as a happy one. So seeing that suffering didn't cause him to be unhappy. He had let go entirely. He let go of wanting or needing things to be other. He let go of attaching to any preferences of perhaps the way he might have wanted them to be. He probably didn't want his good friends and the in the practice, other fellow teachers, Saraputta, others to reach the end of their lives. He wanted to continue to be with them. But he let go. He let go entirely of needing things to be other and realized an unshakable kind of peace and unshakable happiness. And he shared the teachings that point us in this direction. And the teachings are the practice is one that leads to more and more happiness. This is a path of happiness. The Buddha said this is a path of happiness. We do have to see dukkha. We have to see the unreliability. We have to see the cause of the mental suffering. But in seeing those things, we actually open to a greater kind of happiness, open to this unconditional happiness. And the Buddha didn't deny the happiness of the world. He, he practiced a middle way. He said there is a happiness that comes with kind of things going well in our lives. A happiness when we're healthy, being in nature, having good food, being with friends. The Buddha experienced that kind of happiness too. Not a problem. We can be present to enjoy it. Kind of the lurking danger, though, is we tend to hang on to those experiences. We hang on and begin to attach to wanting to have perfect health, to be happy. Maybe we attach to the idea, if I can only get my finances, my 401k just perfectly set up, mm-hmm. I'll be secure and safe, and I won't have to worry anymore. But probably if you do rely upon a 401k, you've seen <laughs> the market dive a little bit in the last year. And things aren't reliable. So when we attach, when we attach to needing things to be a particular way, we attach to the preferences of we have, attach our happiness to those preferences, then inevitably we suffer. We suffer because things are unreliable. Things are constantly changing and we can't make them stable and secure. And it's amazing the way the mind works. After all these years of practice, the mind, this mind here, still latches on and wants things to be a particular way and thinks that if things can just line up, you'll be a better, uh, a deeper kind of happiness. But we can't find that more sustaining kind of happiness through attachment to the material things of the world. So last in November, I was really enjoying good health and really feeling strong and healthy and avoided COVID for two and a half years and exercising a lot and really feeling like, wow, this is great. I avoided it. Two weeks later, COVID. <laughs> can't, can't avoid the ups. Maybe we can't avoid COVID. Maybe so. Like having good luck, but uh, we can't avoid getting sick. We can't avoid getting sick. We can't avoid dying. Everything we know and love of the world will pass away. Everyone we know and love will pass away. There is ultimately no no reliability. I love the quote on your website uh, from Pema Chodron. I'm going to start using it a lot, I think, in the next few months. It's so direct, speaks right to the deepest truth. If you are invested in security and certainty, you are on the wrong planet. (laughs) That just nails it. (laughs) Nails it. There is no security and safety to be found in the material world. That's dukkha. That is dukkha. That's the first noble truth. Things are unreliable in the material world. 
Everything is constantly changing. We can't reach out and get what we want and keep it that way. It changes. We're going to get what we don't want, too. And we can't push away or deny it. We're going to get sick. We're going to have misfortune. We're going to have difficulties in our relationships. Politics of the country are not going to go the way we want them to go. This is dukkha. And then when we cling, when we hold on to needing things to be a particular way, to be happy, then inevitably we suffer. And we can experience it right in a sitting. Like if we have an experience in a sitting, maybe in the last sit, of feeling a lot of ease and peace. And if you reach out, if we reach out, okay, this is it. I got it. I'm going to hang on to this. The moment of hanging on, there's suffering and pop, it's gone. So that's that clinging, the holding on to what we like, the pushing away of what we don't like is a cause of our mental suffering. And the Buddha said we can be entirely free of it. That's the second noble truth, the clinging that is a cause of suffering. And the noble truths are not some distant thing to be realized. They're right in this moment to be realized. There's dukkha in this moment. Everything is constantly changing. If we hang on, we have mental suffering. If we see the suffering, see the hanging on, and let go, we realize peace. Peace is possible. Peace is possible, the third noble truth. Peace is possible in any moment. It's so immediate. And with our practice of being present, aware, present in the body, more and more we can catch the times, maybe when things are going our way, we're enjoying time with friends, and maybe we begin to latch on to this. I want this to continue on. And maybe we just see that and let go, and we can just be simply present to enjoy that good time without hanging on to it. We can actually be more fully present for our lives. So immediate. So with a practice, we can actually enjoy these kind of the, these times of worldly happiness more fully if we're not holding on and pushing away. Uh, but we do need to see where the mind gets caught. And uh, I remember as, as an example, when I came into practice about 22 years ago, I came in, came into practice because I had a lot of physical pain in the body. I hated it. I wanted to get rid of this pain. And I felt I can't be happy in life if I don't get rid of this. In addition, I had a lot of fear, difficult emotions, and I didn't want to feel fear. I just wanted to get rid of the fear and be done with it, have it never come back again. So I was kind of at war with what was present. And my teachers at the time told me to open to the direct experience, to feel the sensations that I was experiencing as pain in the body, to see their changing nature. Be present with it in an intimate, kind, gentle, compassionate way. And to do the same thing with the difficult emotions of fear. With difficult emotions of fear, anger, grief that we all experience. And the amazing thing that, that we see with our practice, for me, was I saw those sensations were constantly changing. And in fact, it was a reactivity that was caused, that was the cause of the pain. 99.9% of the pain I was experiencing was because of the reactivity, because not liking sensations that were just simply unpleasant. I know that's not always the case. Sometimes we can have real pain and, and there can still be some level of reactivity, but even if there's no reactivity, there's, there's real discomfort. I don't mean to say that's always the case. But I still have these sensations in my body, and mostly they're neutral, sometimes unpleasant, but there's very rarely reactivity that occurs. Once in a while, there's a little reactivity, but if I see the reactivity not liking it, not wanting it, it usually melts melts away pretty quickly. And over the course of the years of practice, the relationship to fear has changed. Fear is actually not the enemy. 
When we experience fear, anger, the call of practice is to accept it, to meet it with kindness, kind of to take it and take it up and hold it like the crying baby. It wants attention. Ah, anger, fear, meet it with kindness, acceptance, compassion, even. And uh, we don't so much get rid of fear or anger or grief or jealousy or rage. We change our relationships to those emotions so that they don't overwhelm us. We can meet them with acceptance, maybe even with a sense of peace. It's like this. It's like this now. And see, we don't have to be overwhelmed by them. We can be present for them. And then we can be make the choice in how we want to perhaps act in the world. We may feel anger about something wrong in our lives, some some way that someone has mistreated us, did something wrong. We feel the anger, and we reconnect in the body and stay with our intention to speak with kindness and care, even in the face of someone who's mistreated us, the call of our practice. So a little bit more, I want to speak now about the um, happiness that comes, the practice sukha, the, the contentment, peace, this kind of happiness that's independent of the conditions of the world, that we cultivate with our practice of being present and aware, cultivating intentions of letting go, letting go to accept our experience just as it is, letting go of attachments, Cultivating metta, kindness, care for ourselves, for others, for every part of our experience. And cultivating an attitude of non-harming, not causing harm through our thoughts, words, or actions. That's cultivating what is wise and skillful, letting go, metta, and non-harming. And there's a happiness that comes just with cultivating those intentions that then also manifest in the actions. And three ways they come forward in our practice is that um, as we cultivate our practice, cultivate what is wise and skillful, generosity naturally comes forward, gratitude, and sila, the sense of um, being in harmony with others. So I'll speak a little bit about these three Aspects of practice that come forward and the happiness that comes with them, a happiness that's a little bit more independent of the conditions of our lives and of the world. The gratitude, uh, gratitude, it's, it's, uh, it can be such a rich thing to take time in our lives to reflect on what we're grateful for. Few of us have ever really been truly hungry in our lives, not having enough food. We can be grateful for finding this practice. Grateful for nature, grateful for the time we live in. Finally, and then look back over this, the centuries, there's not many times where a group of gay folks could come together safely like this. Couldn't, probably couldn't have happened 50, 75 years ago. So much to be grateful for. And we can very consciously bring this into our practice to maybe keep a list of things we're grateful for or take time to express gratitude to others. My partner uh, opened the gratitude a few weeks ago. My husband, uh, we make tamales every Christmas. He, he was born in Mexico and family tradition to make tamales. And we made these tamales Great tamales even makes a vegetarian version for me. I don't like the pork he makes. And uh, he bought a new steamer. He used for years, he used something that really looked like a bucket to steam his tamales. He bought a fancy new steamer, and the tamales didn't come out the way he wanted. And he was really hooked. Ah, they didn't come out right, didn't come out right. And then at a certain point, he finally said, you know, if that's the biggest problem in my life, I've got a lot to be grateful for. <laughs> And his heart just opened up. I, I really have a lot to be grateful for. So sometimes when we see the kind of where we get hooked, see the problems we have, and put that in a broader perspective of all the things we have to be grateful for, and bring forward a lot of happiness. 
uh, Brother Steindl Ross, I think it's not much of a secret that he's in our community. But Brother Steindl Ross, who's a kind of the gratitude expert, says um, that uh, it's not happiness that makes us grateful. It is gratefulness that makes us happy. Every moment is a gift. And we can very consciously bring in this into my into our practice. And uh, for many years in my work life, I, I would take time every Friday, have it on my calendar to my gratitude time when I would try and connect with employees and express my gratitude to people I worked with and send an email, write a personal note. And um, it brought forth so much happiness in my life and really, I think, supported happiness in others to be seen and appreciated. A happiness that comes forward with gratitude, and it's a happiness that's not based on attachments. And then uh, generosity. Generosity. Generosity is giving without expecting anything in return. And this has become so important in my practice. There's so much happiness that comes from practicing generosity. And when we feel the impulse to be generous, the defilements of greed, aversion, delusion are not present. The heart is open. Metta is present. Kindness is present. Attachment is not present. Um, so we can appreciate those moments when we feel the impulse to be generous. The practice I follow um, that I learned from Joseph Goldstein is to pay attention to the impulse to be generous. Pay attention. To, I feel it kind of like, ah, kind of heart coming forward, this impulse to practice generosity. It might be just be to, to pause and be present and listen with a friend who's experiencing a difficulty in life. Maybe it's an impulse to offer something or offer money, different ways it might be, or to share share food, whatever it might be. And then have the underlying intention to act on that impulse. Make it kind of a resolve. I make it a resolve. And it's such a rich practice that I will feel the impulse. And then I feel the pulling away. Oh, no, that's too much money or that's too much. I can't give, give that much. And being present for that aversion or the sense of desire that's it's arising, and then remembering, oh, yes, I have this resolve to practice generosity and to act on the impulse. And it brings so much happiness. I had, uh, I was with a friend uh, a few weeks ago, just before Christmas, a really good friend. And I was in his house, and I saw his iPad on the coffee table in front of us. And that iPad is 20 years old. <laughs> Does it really work? Well, kind of. Okay, I'm going to get you a new iPad for Christmas. And it surprised me. It was like a little bit more than I would usually spend on a Christmas present for a friend. Well, a lot more. But it was the, the impulse to give had arisen, and I had the resolve. I recognized I have to act on this. And uh, oh, it brought me a lot of happiness to act on that impulse and to not let the forces of sense, desire, and attachment get in the way of that. And in the same way, my husband and I, we made all those tamales, 100 tamales. Every year, it's at least 100 tamales. And and we're, we always feel like some, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's give some tamales to people we can't be with at Christmas, okay? And I make, make deliveries to a few friends. And it brings a lot of happiness, the simplicity of just sharing food that we've really prepared and prepared from the heart. So the Buddha said there's happiness in the impulse to give, happiness in the in the giving itself, and happiness in the reflection afterwards. And again, this is a happiness that's not associated with attachment to the material world. It, there is no there's no no attachment in the moment that we offer generosity. Story I like to tell. I have some hesitancy because I kind of feel like it's a little selfing, but actually it's not. Is uh, one of the kind of the purest acts of generosity that arose in my practice is um, many years ago. I attended my first metta retreat. I came home. My first day back it was in July, 
Oh, July can be very cold in San Francisco, as you know. And I live right near Market Street, lots of homeless people. And I turned the corner, and there was a man I thought was homeless without a shirt on, without anything the top half of his body. And all of a sudden, this voice spoke and said, oh, you look cold. Here, take my jacket. And where'd that come from? It was from my voice. <laughs> but there was no thinking. It just happened like it could have been from someone standing behind me. And it, it's like, it, it really was startling to me because there was no thought in that process. There was just the recognition of a need and the impulse to give. And it just happened. And it was humbling because there was no me in it. It was actually a moment of insight. There was no me in the generous action. So I couldn't feel it was special. It just happened. There was no I doing the thinking or making the decision. So it's really inspired me in my practice to, to watch for that impulse because it's so pure and there's no me that's underlying it. I would do that a lot uh, I know others of you have been hospice volunteers too, but I learned to do that in my hospice volunteer work, to just watch for that impulse, to, you know, may the words, um, I really I see your beautiful heart, that I would sometimes say with people I was with at the end of their lives, or just the impulse to reach out and touch someone's hand. Trusting that impulse that comes from the heart, that doesn't come from a thinking process. It's like we touch into our own basic goodness, touch into something purer than this thinking mind. When we feel the goodness of our hearts, we feel the impulse come from the heart, and we act on it. And when we practice generosity, there's a sense of enoughness. Like we, we have enough. We don't need to hang on. And that sense of enoughness deeply uproots the force of sense, desire, and attachment, of needing things to be a particular way, of needing more. So there's a great story I remembered in preparing this talk of um, Leonard Cohen. I heard uh, Leonard Cohen, as many of you know, a song a singer and performer, and a very dedicated Zen practitioner. And he spent a year in silence at um, Mount Baldy Zen Center, I think about 2005 or seven. And I heard him interviewed by Koki Roberts, an NPR artist. I wasn't watching, listening, listening, or uh, planning to hear this. It was a surprise when I turned on the radio. And she was interviewing him about, about his year of being in silence and uh, interesting to hear. And a part of the story was in that he had lost all of his money. He had entrusted all of his money to someone to invest probably a lot of savings from being a pretty famous performer. And he lost every penny. I don't know what happened, but all of that money was gone. And Koki Roberts said, how did you feel? How did you feel that money was gone? He said, well, it happened. That's what happened. I'm here now. And she said, no, how do you really feel? How did, how did it feel? She just couldn't get that his mind was not disturbed by that loss, that the kind of the peace and contentment, the ease, the sukha, he had let go entirely, and his mind and heart was not disturbed, even without loss of the money. It was very entertaining to listen to, because it, it went through three or four rounds of these questions, and uh, the interviewer interviewing, interviewing just not getting it. But there was no frustration even in Leonard Cohen's voice in, in responding to that. So as we, as we continue to cultivate our practice, purify our hearts and minds, and then we too really make the commitment to being in the world in a way that's harmonious with others. Uh, sila, not causing harm through our thoughts, words, actions. Seal is often defined as ethics, but I really kind of don't like the word ethics because it's, it can have a sense of following a sense of edicts or beliefs or rules, and that's not the Buddha's teachings on, on sila. The Buddha said that their sila is to be understand, understood in the context of different societies, different times, different even subcultures like the, the gay LGBT subculture that, that we're in. 
And ultimately, uh, sila is about not causing harm, not causing harm to self or others. And really, the, the, the deeper understanding is one of being in harmony, being in harmony with others, kind of a sense of being in harmony with our own hearts, when we're not only not causing harm in the world, but actually doing good in the world, and using our speech to promote harmony, to support folks in coming together, taking actions that not only don't, don't cause harm, but do good in the world. That's what Sila is really about. And there's a happiness that comes with that. The Buddhists call this uh, the bliss of blamelessness. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, happiness, this is the, the sukha kind of happiness. Happiness is when our thoughts, words, and actions are in harmony. And truly, over my years of practice, um, it just becomes more and more clear. Every single action has a consequence. This, this is the law of karma. Every action has a consequence. Now, sometimes we can take an action and no one sees it. No one else knows it. Uh, as, as you may have experienced in life, like sometimes memories come back 20, 30 years after the fact, like, ouch, I said that, I did that. We feel the karmic impact. Kind of like the immediate, the immediacy. You know, like if we yell at someone, we get, we're angry and we respond with anger and we speak harsh words, we know there's a karmic impact. We feel the rattledness afterwards. Maybe the person lashes right back at us. That's a lot of karma. There's a consequence of both skillful and unskillful actions. And the more we cultivate what is skillful, kind, compassionate words, kind, compassionate actions, we're also realizing the karmic benefits of that. The karmic benefits are more happiness, more clarity, more wisdom, our heart being more fully open in the world. I should, I should wrap it up. So... Our gratitude, generosity, sila all come forward with our practice both naturally and as we cultivate these qualities and the happiness, happiness that's independent of the condition to the world that comes forward. And just to close in saying the um, last few minutes, um, cultivating an attitude, intention of renunciation letting go of attaching to our preferences. We all have preferences. We want to be happy, healthy, want things to go our way. But if we let go of attaching our basic happiness to those preferences, we can realize this deeper kind of happiness. The third Zen patriarch said, the great way is not difficult for those not attached to preferences. But he's saying there are preferences but the way is not difficult for those not attached to the preferences. So that's what we're letting go of, letting go of attachment. So, and then we cultivate metta, kindness. It replaces ill will, aversion. Beautiful thing to cultivate in our lives, cultivate for ourselves. Buddha said no one more deserving. And we bring this kindness to every part of our experience. Ram Das, like the gay mystic uh, teacher, this is a statement both on cultivating kindness and renunciation. Being peacefully in relationship to everything made me realize my happiness isn't based on the situation being this way or that way. My happiness is one which embraces my sadness, and my love is one which embraces my own hate. There's a lot of dharma in that quote. Another quote that kind of nails it, like the Tama Shodron quote. And then we cultivate the attitude of, of not causing harm, not causing harm through thoughts, words, or actions. And when we make that deep commitment, then we're actually supporting the natural arising of compassion. Compassion that recognizes suffering, wishes it to end. So two kinds of happiness. This is a worldly happiness, no problem with it. We don't cling to it, and we can enjoy it more if we don't cling. And this deeper kind of happiness that comes forward, sukha, as we practice being present and aware, cultivate what is wise and skillful, and the possibility that we can 
realize this this quality of a contentment, peace, happiness, entirely independent of the conditions of the world, entirely conditioned independent of the conditions of our lives, and the possibility of of being at peace even even as we're dying, even as we're very sick, even as we experience great losses in our lives. Peace is possible in any moment. That's the key teaching of the Buddha. So we're happy to hear any thoughts or answer any uh, question. Um, so it seems like happiness is like a product or a byproduct of other aspects of your life. Is it something that you use as a metric? Like I'm not happy enough. I I need to I need to change things, or yeah. do you just focus on other aspects of your life? Uh, yeah, if I'm if I'm not not happy, then I then I feel like okay, what's present? What's aware? What what's present? I need to be aware of what's present, and maybe if, not, not happy. if I'm not happy, you know, I might be in a kind of a, a foggy state. I'm not happy. Oh, what what's going on here? Uh, I feel anxiety. Okay, I feel anxiety in my body. You know, it might be some kind of like continue to check in. I remember this happening. Some time ago, I felt just really cloudy and not clear and not present. And I stayed with the anxiety and kind of checking out what's going on. And then I remembered, okay, I had this conversation with my sister on the phone and I was upset by something, but I kind of shoved it down and didn't deal with the emotions who were present. And then I could like, okay, I recognize now there's some upset about what was said, um, my concern about a niece. And then I could go back to being present with my partner for watching the show that we were, we were, we were there for. That was a kind of missing out on the show because I was caught in this anxiety. I wasn't happy. So to keep turning toward what, what's present. And, and sometimes it may be something unpleasant that's present. Yeah. That, that would be the practice. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I'm not with a practice. Okay. There's something unpleasant. I'm unhappy. Let's go find something happy. Practice. Be what is here now, and by being present with what is here now and seeing it, being intimate with it, that's it'll open to more happiness in our lives, more clarity too. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love the story about giving the homeless man a coat. Mm-hmm. Uh, it sounded like, uh, in a way, that doing these practices that we remove obstacles, uh, and you have just come from a meta retreat. In a way, the generosity or the uh, the compassion that arises did itself. It yeah. Sort of, you, you couldn't believe it was you. Mm-hmm. In a way, but. yeah, it's, it just happens. It's yeah. it's it's so beautiful because the. Uh, I hesitate to say it because there is a value in thinking, but wisdom does not arise from thinking. Yes. Wisdom does not arise from thinking. Yeah. The clarity, the understanding comes from our direct experience. And more, it comes from the heart. Like, ah, I see the pain that's present. I need to act. And uh, it's so beautiful to trust that because it's, we're, we're trusting into something much deeper than this thinking mind and um we're really connecting with who we who we most deeply are, like quality of love and presence, spaciousness. Not not this body, not this thinking mind. Something much deeper. And in effect, we're recognizing that everything we want in life, the perfect purity of heart and mind, it is actually already here. It really is already here. And we practice to, to see and recognize it's here, nothing missing. So in those moments, those impulses happen of generosity, or we feel great gratitude, we feel compassion. We're connecting with that with that perfect purity that is already here. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a note that sharing I just gave you. It felt I um, was speaking from here, yeah. not from here. Not from here. <laughs> Not from the head. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
Tom on the line has a question. Go ahead, Tom, on you. Yes, thank you for that very um, inspiring talk. And um, I it made me kind of laugh at myself because last night I had gotten off work. I work in retail in Portland, Oregon. And um, I was in line at the grocery store. And uh, there was a gentleman ahead of me that just had two items. And one of the items was, a, I think, a Marie Callender cream pie or something for dessert. And he didn't have enough money to pay for it. And uh, I, I wish I could say now that I gave him the money to buy it, but uh, <laughs> there were so many, there was people lined up behind me. The cashier was, you know, trying to juggle uh, the fact that he didn't have enough money and taking it off his bill. And uh, all this stuff went through my head. Well, if I, if I offer to pay for it now, the cashier will be burned out and, you know, on it, you know, all this stuff went through my head and it didn't happen. So that's, that's a case in point of not overthinking it. I think. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that you were really doing the practice and you're doing the practice now, which is, which is the edge, like to watch for the impulse and watch what the mind does and seeing it exactly as you're seeing it. There's a purification process to supporting a purification of your heart and mind, and uh, no need to judge, judge yourself yeah, for not having given the money. Don't judge yourself. Never helps to practice. Uh, <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Yes. So it's. I feel like this is perhaps an overly theoretical or intellectual question, but uh, as you were talking about it, and I appreciated all you have to say, and I certainly found the practice helpful, uh, particularly for equanimity. And so the question is that I've noticed that people in general, and me in particular, happiness tends to arise out of a contrast in part. So for example, if your knee hasn't been hurting, Mm -hmm. So what? Mm -hmm. But if your knee was hurting and now it's not hurting, ooh, yeah. happiness. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I wonder if uh, achieving equanimity, which still seems yeah. more worthwhile to me, uh, but if that cuts off some of the highs also, I, I wonder what if there's teaching about that. The, the equanimity of accepting it's like this now, accepting kind of with a spaciousness, a balance of the heart, equanimity accepted, uh, accepts all of the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs. So equanimity can be this great support, like this, in the spaciousness of this life, there's knee pain now. And I see, look outside, and I see today is a beautiful day, there's a break from the rain, I see the trees, it's a tree is so green, and there's knee pain, but there's the beauty of the sky and nature. Now that knee pain's gone, and that feels like a relief. So it's it's kind of the, the spaciousness and right. balance. Focus less on the painful parts, but still enjoy the contrast when it's less. Yeah, yeah, and it's a way of opening. Equanimity <laughs> does have this spacious quality, so the way you can just reconnect with it pretty easily is like to bring in maybe the phrase. It's like this. There's this knee pain, and just look around a little bit and see. There's there are all these other things in this experience, in life now too. It's there's an immediate benefit of that. But a great way of measuring sukha, this happiness, maybe contentment can be a better word for many folks. A contentment that's independent of conditions is often felt more like I feel pretty content with life as it is. And there's problems that arise, and there's challenges, and this body's aging, and I have pain in my body, as I do. Uh, but there's a broader sense of contentment and ease. And we, we might, at that point, really have to look back 10 or 15 or 20 years and realize, oh, that's quite a bit different than what my life was like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You know, see, I just say this in my practice, as I'm doing my practice here, and I had almost thought, I'm not going to bring any notes today and see what that's like, but I didn't. And it's interesting to see, like, as I 
respond to the questions and comments, how I feel more alive and not attaching to the notes and the thinking process. It feels more alive with the Dharma uh, because it's coming coming from here. So maybe you're noticing that too. <laughs> Do you have any advice on tamale steamers to a <laughs> <laughs> Don't get a lid with a hole on top. <laughs> that was the problem. <laughs> okay, well, um, it's time for announcements. So thank you, John, first of all. Great talk, and thanks to everyone for participating in questions and um, uh, announcements. Yes. Uh, I just want to remind people that we have an encountered community thrift in 17th and Valencia. And if you contribute things, we get a share of the proceeds. It's a great way to support the summit. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And seeing your face reminded me that to tell the new folks here that there's all, that we also meet on Wednesday nights. So we're here every Sunday and we're online on Wednesdays. Um, the same connection. Same, same, same Zoom link, yeah. Any other? Yes? Uh, I'm the host today, so please uh, stay and enjoy the uh, fellowship of the Sangha. Uh, we have some vegan treats um, and uh, hot water for tea. Uh, if you have some tea, you put your cup in the sink and I'll take care of it at the end of the meeting, the social hour. Um, I'll be coming around with the Dawn Bowl. Uh, your generosity helps us meet the expenses of our Sangha. Uh, the rent for this um, space, uh, honor that we offer speakers, um, printing and mailing of the newsletter that goes largely to people who are incarcerated. And we also have an ongoing project right now to convert our 800 plus Dharma talks into a format that will make them more widely available as podcasts. Um, so, um, anything that you get to uh, donate, we suggest ten to twenty dollars. But um, we're grateful for any anything that you choose to donate. Um, sometimes at twelve thirty, people gather at the front door to go to lunch together, and so open to anybody to um, join in on that. It's very informal, and I think that's all. Cool. I'd also like to recognize and thank um, Matthew and Henry, who both signed up to be Zoom Hilda uh, here to, so that we can keep this going as a hybrid meeting. So Zoom people, you better wave at them. <laughs> um, all right. And then I also popped into the Zoom chat the link for Donna and the past recordings. Yeah, hundreds of uh, podcasts and um Thanks to George, our volunteer audio wizard. We'll have it. John's talk will be up uh, on this website soon as well. And um, next week, Kevin Griffin is going to be the teacher. He's a Buddhist teacher and author known for his innovative work connecting Dharma and recovery, especially through his 2004 book, One Breath at a Time, Buddhism and the Twelve Steps. He has been a Buddhist practitioner for over 30 year, 35 years and a teacher for two decades. He reaches a broad range of audiences in Dharma centers, wellness centers, and secular mindfulness settings. His latest book is Buddhism and the Twelve Steps, Daily Reflections. Um, and he was uh, scheduled to speak here some time ago and felt ill, so uh, we'll look forward to having him back. Actually, his Facebook is called Living Kindness. Living Kindness? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, come again next week. Uh, any other announcements, questions, anything? Um, all right, then we will gather for our dedication of merit. John, do you, have, um, do you have a dedication that you'd like to use, or should we use our traditional one here? Whatever you prefer. Oh, okay. We'll just uh, stand up, though. <laughs> By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. 
Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.